Music to some people, it is to me. There's nothing I like to hear better than a Model D. And they can remember hearing it plow and working over the hills, the old popper going. It's nice and slow as well. It's so reminiscent of something you live in. One thing I remember about the John Deere is they made such a funny noise. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's, it sounds powerful. I think, uh, uh, to me, it does. It, uh, gives you a sign of, you feel like you're really driving a tractor when you're driving one of these. I don't know, I guess there's just something about the pup, pup of the two-cylinder engine that's kind of neat. Well, I like the sound of two-cylinder. A lot of people got to have more than two-cylinder, but it don't make any difference to me. Well, I like the sound, some hate the sound, but uh, anybody that's run them way back loves to hear it again because it's the sound of the past. In July of 1987, Men, women, and children from all over the world gathered in Waterloo, Iowa. These people had one thing in common, a love of two-cylinder tractors. A farm tractor called the Waterloo Boy first rolled off the production line at the Waterloo Gasoline Engine Company in 1912. This two-cylinder wonder helped to begin the movement from horsepower to mechanical power. In 1918, when I was about 15 years old, it was lots of fun. It was the first track that I ever drove. And it really was something. Here I went plowing. I had uh, plowed already quite a bit. I plowed it apart. Here somebody came and took the picture. And I was taking a rest. I had no cab, you know. There was a clutch in the land wheel. And you pulled a little rope, and the plow came up. Supposedly, you know, didn't always make it. And then when you put it in again, you pulled the rope, the plow went down. So you had levers, adjusted, the depth, that went pretty good. Oh, that's the old Waterloo. That's my dad, and that's me. We were getting ready to go out and saw wood. We put the saw rig on in front, and those chain wirings here. And the belt, and then the buck. Then we were ready to saw. And it was no easy job. As I was growing up, we were farming with horses entirely. And um, the old gang plowing, five horses. And that furnished our power. The first power we had was a Waterloo boy. And that was proved uh, not quite equal to the load. That's when the John Deere's came out with the first Model D. And we acquired one of those. And that seemed to be equal to the task, because other tractors that were available at that time using gasoline would uh, take about two and a half gallons of gasoline per acre, and the John Deere Model D would uh, do the same job for a gallon and three pints of kerosene. At that time, kerosene was selling for nine cents a gallon. The Waterloo Boy was only the beginning. Two-cylinder tractors in a wide variety of models revolutionized the way people farmed the land. Born on the farm where I live yet, my father born there before me and my grandfather started farming up there. Uh, it was all horse-drawn equipment in my early days. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say horse-drawn, some of it was going out in the field with a hoe and hoe out morning glories in the cornfield too. <laughs> I guess. From there on, eventually they got into a tractor. First one that I had anything to do with was a used John Deere Model B. As a kid out of high school, I wanted a tractor. My dad didn't see much in that, but uh, he come along with it and 
from there on, we've had quite a few green ones over the years. This setup required a person to drive the tractor, and that's how I got my start. I believe I was about seven years old when I was introduced to the D, and, and that's an image you can't get out of your mind, looking down at that cover plate, the Waterloo Engine Company at Waterloo, Iowa. And I mean, this stands as a mystery in a boy's mind, you know. And getting back to this binder, though, that was uh, why I have such an admiration for a binder, that uh, it's a... You look at it, you look out on them as a kind of a frail, delicate machine, but however, it seemed like they took a masculine job, that they could go through heavy grain, light grain, hemp weeds higher in your head, it'd shake and rattle, but it'd st still keep uh, taking it in and tying them up. Well, our first tractor was this 1932 GP John Deere. Bought it in 1938, used. My dad traded off a team of horses for it. <laughs> and we got a hold of an old plow, and, and I, uh, I did a lot of plowing with it. I learned to plow with a th uh, three horses and a two-fire plow up on the Cotswolds in England. And on this 640-acre farm, we had just one little 15-horse Alice Chalmers Model B tractor. Did everything else with horses. And we were offered a new John Deere AR tractor. And from the moment it arrived on the farm, I took it over and drove the thing. I was a pupil on this farm. And I suppose from there on the tractor, it said, John Deere, Moline, Ill. So I wrote to John Deere, Moline, Ill. And they wrote back and said, when the war's over, come and visit us. So I came over here first in 1947. And I've been coming back ever since. As these two-cylinder tractors worked the fields at the amazing speed of two and a quarter to three miles per hour, a new industry was born. Not only did factories have to make them, but dealers and salespeople had to sell them. Initially, many farmers just didn't trust power sources that didn't run on hay. A D John Deere, that was my first new tractor, and ever since that time I've drove John Deere tractors all my life. Well, we, we seed with six horses and maybe 20 acres per day. And with the D. John Deere, I made eight, up to 80 acres per day. Most farmers at that time were, uh, were horse farmers, uh, with few exceptions, of course. But the majority of them hadn't uh, really gotten into the power farming technology. And uh, so it was a... It was a a real selling job to convince farmers that uh, tractors was the way to go. Almost every dealer had what they called a mule barn. And uh, the traded in mules would be out there in that barn. And sometimes even when they would sell a new tractor uh, and take mules in on trade, uh, they might even have to switch mules in order to, to balance the deal. And in those days, that Model A on skeleton steel wheels, the dealers de uh, delivered them by driving them out from town to the farm. And I was, uh, when the day came to our farm, it was in the afternoon, and I was in country school saying that the door was open to the, to the road, but you couldn't uh, be constantly looking behind us, waiting for this tractor to go by, so you tried to coordinate it at the right moment before the teacher would call you down or this idleness and as I looked around all I seen was the was the the spoke or the lugs whipped by the edge of the door they had I didn't look soon enough to see the tractor but <laughs> and, and I had to wait for that thrill when you went home to see it on your yard tractor power changed many aspects of farm life boys no longer walked behind teams of horses their rite of passage into manhood was judged by their ability to control the family tractor. Coming out of, out of the house after lunch, and he done left for town, and we still like somebody done a horn. And, uh, I'd seen him start to crank that away, just like this in here was. And I thought, well, I'd crank that old A, it won't take me long to hard that down. And sure enough, that old A come to life, and he come back from town. He said, see me out there horn. He said, if you can drive it, and you get down the horn and get hooked on a disc, get something ready for in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> And I've been driving the John Deere ever since. Well, I remember the first time I started a B John Deere, I, we had dairy cattle and probably, uh, see, about 21 cows, and we drove through the center of the barn and cleaned the gutter out on each side. And uh, you 
start the tractor up to move up for dad, you know, and I'd keep trying every time he was a scooping manure and, and I was four years old the uh, first time I got it started. I, I, I can remember that yet. The internal combustion engine changed more than field work. It brought to the farm home a new freedom. More and more, mechanical labor replaced hand labor. Come here, I want to show you something. Okay. This is a little John Deere gas engine, yeah. and what they're doing here is pumping water. Yeah. Well, back when I was your age, we either had this or we had a windmill which would run the pump. Yeah. If we didn't have no wind and didn't have the gas engine, you see, then we had to handle and then we had to pump it by hand. Yeah. And my uh, dad on the farm, we raised hogs, we had cattle, we had livestock, and you see, it took a lot of water. And my brother and I spent many an hour pumping water because at first we didn't have a gas engine uh -huh. and the windmill didn't blow and the livestock had to have water. Yeah. Now you see over there, they got a little corn sheller. They also used the gasoline engine on running the corn sheller. And then uh, the women in the house, if they didn't turn the wash machine back and forth, they, ha they also made it so they could run it with the gas engine. Well, you had to go out there and do a lot of physical work, didn't we? Drive them horses, you get up in the morning pretty early so you could get out and get a lot done. I even used horses some after I got my age on deer, but I finally weaned away from them and got more other tractors. John Deere low. <laughs> Just like today, harvest time was a special time on the farm. In severe weather, people had to work together to get the crop in. Neighbors were an essential to farm life. In those days, you know, we still had the habit of not starting to pick corn probably until the last week of October, and then it run way into Thanksgiving time. Not many uh, pickers in the country at that time, and if a neighbor was getting a little worried about his corn getting snowed in, and you were done with your corn picking, and you had a picker, well, he was over there, and, and uh, he wanted you to come over probably and finish his field for him. And, so uh, a little, uh, that's the days when they should have had cabs with heaters in, but uh, all we had was sheepskin coats and ear laps. <laughs> I was a little guy, and when that thing came down the road, I could see it uh, with them lights, you know, and they were just shiny in the sun. I could just see it like yesterday. And the sun uh, was shining on them lights and the right. slight little twinkle stars, you know. And I'd sit there with my legs hanging down off the edge of the road on, on our side, you know, the right. ditch, straight up and down ditches. And then it run up there, and then of course you run alongside, and it was awesome. Wasn't it awesome? My father had John Deere with an old D, and we thrashed. And I was 11 years old, and we pulled in. I don't remember the farm, but anyhow, he says, this morning, he says, we need somebody pitching off the stacks. And what we did is they stacked grain side by side, and then they pulled the thrashing machine in between, just went in between the stacks. And he said, get up on the top and start throwing. So I thought, all right, I'll give it a try, young man. And it's a thrill to sit there and be able to work with the, the big boys, you know. And everything was going fine. I had a third of the stack off. And I sit there, and I had the fork. And I got a hold of something and got a bundle, and it stuck. And when I let it go, fork and all went. And there she goes. And I hollered. They tried to run to the tractor and shut it down. But that time, she already hit the blower. And you should have seen the racket and the holes that thing made in that thrashing machine. So you can imagine I was the most unpopular kid in the, <laughs> in the, in the group that day. So he says, off of that stack, young man. He says, you're going to work now. And he put me on the bagger. That's all work. <laughs> From 1912 till 1961, two-cylinder tractors were built in Waterloo and Dubuque, Iowa, and Moline, Illinois. First came the lettered models, the D, GP, GP Wide Tread, the A, B, G, H, L, M, and R tractors. Then the numbered series, the 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80 series, followed by the 320, the 420, 520, 620, 720, and 820. And the final two-cylinder tractors, the 330, 430, 530, 630, 730, and 830, introduced a new age of tractor power. 
but it was these two-cylinder tractors that started a legacy. A legacy that has continued from father to son, from generation to generation. The tractor here was has never been out of the family. I'm the third owner of it. My granddad bought it new in 1937. My dad worked for the John Deere dealer that he bought it from. He serviced it when it was new, did the pre-delivery service. And my granddad traded it off in 52 on a new one. And his one son-in-law bought it. And he had it till 1963. And then I bought it, and I've had it ever since. My uncle, he bought bought the D. My dad didn't think the D was good, wasn't big, was big enough, and he bought an Eagle tractor. And uh, I had heard him complain about that different times that he wished he'd have bought a new D at the same same time as the other D. And he ended up with a 34 D. And I still have both those Ds. Well, I've been collecting them for 25 years now, and uh, but originally I drove one on my grandfather's farm. I was 10 years old, 1936, and it was a GP, uh, just like that one sitting right over there, right across from us here. And when my, my uncle had John Deere's also, he had a, he had D's. He had a D John Deere, which is very similar to that one, only it's larger. Uh, there aren't any right here. There's one sitting right across over there. And then when my father was farming, uh, my father bought John Deere's too, and we had three John Deere's when we were farming. Nearly 50 years of tractor history. But why do these people collect them? What is unique about the two-cylinder tractor? Why have people gathered in Waterloo, Iowa to look at these relics of the past? I think uh, a lot of people have been in, involved with John Deere tractors in their life some way or another, either running them or working on them or selling them or building them or whatever. And uh, they're going back, you know, remembering what they've, they've worked with in the past and they want a tractor like they used to drive. Well, the thing that astonishes me is, is how these products that are like 50 years old are still in the condition that they can be rebuilt. Uh, I, I don't know that the products you buy in this day and age will be that good a shape 50 years from now. Oh, two cylinders turned me on, and we got all the bigger tractors. And as a boy, I was always wanting these old two cylinders, and that's the reason why I started collecting them. I started about 18 years ago. I rode with a man on an old Model D that was jerking the plow along. He didn't have enough power to pull it, so he just jerked it along. And he told me what a strong thing that was. And that interested in me how simple and how well built it was. And so I found an old Model D and went from there. I was bitten by the bug. Yes, collecting two-cylinder tractors has become a hobby, an obsession, and as some people said, a disease. These collections require organization, attention to detail, perseverance, an artistic flair, a motivation to maintain our heritage, and a love of that heritage. The variety of models and variations of models keep collectors busy because each tractor is unique in its own way. See, they make a lot of these tractors that look alike, except for maybe a minor change in the uh, air filter or the uh, exhaust pipe or the manifold maybe, or the magneto could be different. But basically the transmission, the engine, and the uh, differential are all the same. Then the radiator, they make it, might have made the same tractor for three or four or five years. Well, it's the 1915. It's built in October, 1915. It's a real early one. It's got the round spoke wheels. It's got the uh, unusual fuel tank on it. Later on, they come with stands because they found out when your fuel got low on the tank, it didn't get back to the carburetor. So they went to a different type of fuel tank. Now this is a 1935 GPO Lindemann crawler. It was a GPO crawler built by John Deere and then converted by the Lindemann brothers in Yakima, Washington into a crawler. Uh, they converted uh, between 20 and 25 tractors. 
in the late or in the middle 30s. It's a 1936 Model BI, an industrial version of the, the BR series. Made and uh, shipped to Rochester, New York in 1936. Tractors were used for road maintenance, uh, street maintenance, golf course work, and things like this. It's a 1936 John Deere Model A that we found in the weeds at a sawmill. It was stuck, had no tires on it, and it was in very rough condition. This tractor was made in the heart of World War II in 1943, and it came out with on full steel as rubber tires on a lot of tractors in them days was, was hard to come by. And uh, it's got a cast iron frame on it, which is different from, from some of the earlier tractors and some of the later tractors that was used during the war. We come from a, a GP, a 28D, on up to my last two cylinder is an 820. Did we got a good start for you, don't hey, Daddy. we? Got a good start. Look at Daddy, that. Did you forget a cab tractor? Oh yeah, we got a cab tractor, yeah. <laughs> but I have collected tractors for eight years and my total now is right close to 500 John Deere tractors. Tractor collecting is not limited to models used in North America, nor are collectors limited to this continent. Over 40 visitors from overseas came to Waterloo just to see these two-cylinder tractors. Well, we're all from Christchurch, New Zealand, and the prime reason for being here in the United States is to attend the show. I've got a collection of 30 John Deere's. Most of them are I bought restored um, or in as-is condition. I don't restore them if they're good original. Um, they're almost all on loan to our science museum. Well, I've been always interested in John Deere tractors, especially the two-cylinder type, many years ago. An old uncle of mine used to have one, and when he finished with it in about 1965, he gave it to me. And then for a few years, I used to use it, and it gave trouble, and for about 12 years, it was in pieces. And I was best man at another wedding, and Veronica here was the head's bridesmaid, and I met her at this wedding, and uh, that, that wedding was, uh, wed the transport was on the tractor, on a David Brown tractor. And I got to know Veronica a bit better after that. And uh, we decided to get married. So we uh, got married on the John Deere. <laughs> yeah, which was at that time in a, a pile of pieces. It hasn't been touched for 12 years, as I said. We had a lot of work to do to get it all ready, get all the parts and get it working properly. The Waterloo boys that were shipped to the UK in the early part of the century were uh, repainted when they were received over there. I don't know why they were repainted, but they repainted it and marketed it under another name, which is the overtime. This gathering of tractor collectors, people who appreciate beautifully restored antiques, and people who remember the glory days of the two-cylinder machine, provided ample opportunity to trade stories, evaluate techniques about how to restore the iron and steel treasures, and compare the sizes of their collections. I like to buy them and, and restore them. That's, that's the, on rainy days and spare time, that's, that's my hobby like other guys do going to fish or something. This is my hobby of, of restoring one of these tractors. This is my grandson, and he was the first one, he was just a little guy, and, and uh, never get his hands in grease that's a mortal sin but we got an old 47 home and towed it in we start scraping before you clean before you do anything you see what you got underneath the grease and the oil he come out from underneath that thing with the putty knife and i wish you could have seen the changeover <laughs> oh i have about 50 john deere tractors on my farm and peabody can at peabody kansas and uh, they vary from the from the smallest to the largest two cylinder and at the time, a friend of mine made this up in his shop, about 30 miles from where I live. Grew up on a farm, and uh, I did all the work on my dad's tractors. And I've always had an interest in the old tractors. And just two years ago, I was in a position where I acquired the first one. And uh, this is the first one that I restored. I uh, generally collect the small ones, the L series. I uh, start with the 1936 Y. I go to a 37 model 62 and then through 38s up through the 46s we have other john deere tractors probably another 20 25 at home at all stages from being restored to uh, ones that 
looks like junk to most people. And uh, most of the time we buy them that way. I bought this in a basket, you might as well say, about four years ago. It took me two years to restore it. Well, when I was a little kid, we used to have an old D. John Deere sitting behind the chicken house and we used to go play on it. We used to sit there and stick a garden hose in the, in the exhaust pipe and watch water run out of the pedcocks and pour dirt in it and, oh, we just, just wrecked the thing. But then we eventually took it apart and cleaned it up and put it back together. It's sitting there at home now, restored. It's a 29. Yeah, it runs good now, but it didn't when we was pouring the sand and the dirt and the water in it. <laughs> First of all, it's the cleanup job, and on some of these tractors, it cleaned on them for two weeks solid before you could get them cleaned up enough to tear them apart and start restoring it. You usually try to get three, four tractors of the same variety, so if we need a part, we go steal it off of one and put it on the other one. The old, the old adage is somebody else's junk is our delight. So I guess it is. And to bring them back, everyone we bring back and put in the barn and keep it and run it for our own pleasure, keep it from the junkyard. And it's always Waterloo boys. There's never no Waterloo girls. <laughs> are these tractors relegated to museums and private collections? Or are they still being used for the purpose for which they were designed? Present time, I've got uh, five John Deere Bs and one A around the place even now. Still using a couple of them. We just use this f tractor around the farm, like pawn wagons, short j chores around the job, hay wagons, silage wagons. Oh, I guess I grew up on the two cylinders, and I knew them inside and out, and I just can't quit. I got a lot of parts for them. I, I use about 35 of them. I got one tractor saddled into every job, so I never change them from I just change seats. The two-cylinder tractor, the beginning of mechanical power on the farm. A tractor that began a tradition that will continue into the future. But this tractor, or any tractor, is only a tool. A tool for the men and women who feed our world. A tool that provides a key to a lifestyle. A way of life that is based on a love of the land. The fact that they grew up on a farm and can watch uh, animals and, and uh, crops uh, we learned some of the basics of uh, life itself, and uh, we uh, enjoyed the uh, fellowship then and the cooperation of neighbors and uh, friends as they were exchanging work with each other in order to get the jobs done. I wouldn't trade growing up on the farm for anything. My dad was a hard man, and we worked from dawn to dusk. I'd get up in the morning, we'd have them full of gas, and we'd plow till dark, no lights on the equipment then. And I would always try to see if I could outdo my dad. And uh, it was a good life on the farm, even though he was pretty strict. And here I am today, a frustrated farmer with 10 acres and an old John Deere. Uh, I've often wondered what people that, that didn't grow up on the farm, what they had to look forward to. There's always something on the farm you can always look forward to. There's always something to change. And, uh, if I had to do it all over again, I'd still be a farmer. Farming has never been easy. But more than any other occupation, it is essential to human survival. Farmers have experienced good times and bad times. But good farmers have always prospered. The farmer is unique. And his uniqueness ensures that today, tomorrow, and forever, we can be confident that the soil will give up its bounty so that we may endure. Well, farming's a long-term process, isn't it? We are definitely got to have the agricultural, and uh, it, it's, it's going to come back. Without farming, uh, they can't manufacture what the farmers can. The question was asked once, where does money come from? Uh, you think a long time, and the, the real place where money comes from is the soil. That uh, everything comes from the soil. If it's mineral or the crops, you see, it's all evolved from the soil. I think it's going to be great. Someday they're, they're going to sit in the house and run these tractors. Although it's just like being in an air-conditioned place now with the 
8450 is my new tractor. That's the new series. And I just love to go out there and work on that tractor. If I was a young man and to go and to start over again, I would be a farmer. We're out in the open. We got something different every day. It's a challenge. You got livestock. You see them little pigs, little lambs, the calves grow up out there in the grass. Hey, there. I don't see that. I don't think there's anything nicer than to see that. You go in a factory or somewhere's out. Okay, it's the same story all over. You're out. Look at this nice fresh air and the sunshine. Yeah. I think it's the best place health-wise that there is. I just love farming.